Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about the unbelievable, exotic, colorful, somewhat dysfunctional music of English composer Granville Bantock. And oh, has he got a life story, which I found out on my recent trip to the planet Baxia. Because as you may know, Bantok came from Bantokia, which is the fourth moon of the planet Baxia. But how he got there and how the moon got its name Bantokia is quite a story. And I really need to tell you because it will explain a lot about, about the music of Granville Bantok. Now, Bantok's parents were Baxians who were resident in London. And he was born, let's see, in 1868. And he died in 1946. He had quite a long life. And you'll see why in a moment. But he was born in London. And then as a child, his parents took him back to planet Baxia. But here was the problem. His actual name should never have been Bantock. He had a very strange happenstance as a child. You know, it was sort of like something out of a Gilbert and Sullivan opera, you know, where like in, in HMS Pinafore, you know, Buttercup gets was a nurse and she gets the babies mixed up. Well, Bantock had the same issue. What we don't know and has just recently been discovered is that he chose the name Bantock or he chose to keep the name Bantock because when he was a child, the nurse in the neonatal unit transposed one letter of his name. She put an N where an R should have been. In other words, his real name, his real family name was Bartok. And that's why his parentage has been so hard to trace. He was actually the English bunch of the same family that gave us Bella Bartok. Although being English, they spelled it a little differently, of course. And if the R had been kept instead of the N, his life would have been very, very different. I think there's no question about that because his parents, whose name was Bartok, took him back to Baxia. See, we're getting left with a lot of Bs here. But as he grew up as a rebellious youth, he kept the name Bantok. So he's a Bartok as a Bantok on Baxia. And that's where his life starts. Now, this is where things get interesting. The fourth moon of Baxia, now known as Bantokia, was always an uninhabited, desolate place with no signs of intelligent life whatsoever. And his music rather reflects this, actually, as we'll show you in a moment. But as he was growing up, he was constantly in trouble. And as a young adult, he was finally uh, arrested and convicted for the capital crime in Baxia of impersonating a composer. And as a person impersonating a composer, uh, he was, of course, sentenced to death. But then there was there was a whole a whole outcry about capital punishment. You know, you know how the story goes, all that nonsense. And so they didn't know what to do with him. And they decided to turn the the moon Bantakia into a penal colony. And he was exiled to Bantakia. And now Bantakia, now, as you all know, I mean, it's a resort. It's, it's lovely. It has, it has its own attractive flora and fauna. And, and because it had no intelligent life on it, and arguably still doesn't, uh, it was a perfect place to become a penal colony because the, the, the climate was congenial, but it was far away and you couldn't get off of it. And there's nothing there except for some like plants and fungi and things like that. And so Bantock was sent to the penal colony, which at that point was called penal colony number one. And it was subsequently changed to Bantokia because while on Bantokia, he produced just an extraordinary amount of music. And it turned out that 
far from impersonating a composer, he actually sort of became one. I mean, he just wrote and wrote and wrote tons and tons of music. I mean, one of his, his most you know remarkable works was this thing, the complete Omar Khayyam, which is like three hours long. It's been recorded by Chandos, not quite complete. And this Lyrita broadcast with Norman Del Mar, which is absolutely complete. It is obviously, quite obviously, the work of a person who was exiled and had absolutely nothing else to do. I mean, because it just has lots of notes. You know what I mean? And he also did this complete song of songs. I mean, you know, he wrote these enormous choral works and tons and tons of orchestral music. And the orchestral music is usually on very, very exotic themes. And, you know, people on Baxia were stunned that Bantakia was beginning to gain uh, more notoriety than Baxia's own Arnold Bax, at least at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was cause for great consternation. And it, there was really nothing much that they could do about it, except transform the penal colony, as I suggested, into a kind of sort of resort vacation destination and name it Bantakia in the hopes that Baxia would retain its, its illustrious reputation. And that, that really worked. It really worked because for, for many, many years, although, although Bantak's output as a composer or quasi-composer, whatever he allegedly was, was well known, his, his, his music wasn't played, whereas Bax's was consistently gaining in attention and notoriety. However, however, at the beginning of the 1980s and 1990s, Hyperion Records initiated a disc of Bantokian orchestral works. And here it is. There are some other recordings of his orchestral works, but this is this is sort of the 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 big the big set, the whole enchilada. Six discs worth of stuff. And we're going to talk about it now. I'm going to tell you what's in here so that you get a good sense of Bantokian syntax is terribly important if you're going to understand his music, because Bantok was not the most original composer. He was pretending to be a composer and sort of borrowing stuff from everywhere. Most of his music is on exotic themes, and he's probably at his best in music of sort of pagan sensuality. I mean, it's obviously the work, as I said, of a guy in exile with not much to do and nothing to entertain himself other than a stack of out-of-print National Geographic magazines, which he used presumably for the purpose that, that most, you know, sort of adolescent males of that age used National Geographic magazines for. And, uh, you know, you can sort of tell in his, in his music that there is that element of sensuality. And let's look, let's look at these pieces now, these discs one at a time, and talk about what we get. So you get a sense of just by name, and I'll play you a sample also of, of pieces. Now, the first disc contains a Celtic symphony. He pronounced it Celtic, not Celtic, uh, for string orchestra with six harps. That's loads of fun. I mean, anything with six harps is going to be loads of fun. Then we get this tone poem. He wrote a bunch of them, and he named them. This is The Witch of Atlas. Ooh, the Witch of Atlas. And then there's the Sea Reavers, which is the Hebridean Sea Poem number two. There were a bunch of Hebridean Sea Poems. And finally, a Hebridean Symphony, which is one of his biggest and most completely brainless orchestral works. There's something absolutely autistic about this piece. And I'm going to play you a sample of it, not from this recording, because there's another version on Marco Polo with um, Adrian Leeper and the Czechoslovak State Symphony Orchestra. And you just got to hear this thing to believe it. It's really quite amazing. So, so give it a listen.
Now, did you note that trumpet thing that was going on? Bump, ba dump, bump, ba dump, bump, ba dump. That is the main motive of the symphony, in case you had any question. It is also the national anthem of Bantakia. It is the only national anthem that consists only of three notes. Bump, ba dump. It also kind of sounds like an obsessive compulsive take on uh, Taras Balba by Janacek, although that was written later because the, the Hebridean Symphony was written in 1915. I have never heard anything like that. I mean, and, and I pity, truly pity the trumpeters who, as you could hear in that example, were obviously ready to give up the ghost. But nonetheless, Leeper's performance is somewhat more exciting than Handley's performance on this first disc. Never mind. You get a sense of it, don't you? Now, this sort of this sort of mind-numbing, you know, repetition is a feature of a lot of Ben Talk's work, um, and uh, you know, you just sort of take it or leave it as you go. It's all very colorful and very nice, but form and sometimes thematic distinction were not always his strongest points. I think disc number two, you get a pagan symphony. Oh, what could be more fun than that? Hmm. And you get his 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 a uh, defensive inconstancy, fi fine at the fair. Now this could be this could be pronounced fifine, or fifine, or fifine. It's f i f i n e. And you know those of you who speak Bantakian, I mean ban the Bantakian language is almost the same as Baxian, but of course it's a dialect. And so how you pronounce fifine, fifine, fifne, fifne, fife is completely up to you. And those of you who specialize, as I said, in the dialects of the planet Baxia might tell me how to do it. Then you get Cuchillian, Cuchulan's Lament, which is heroic ballad number one. And you get Kushmul's, Kishmul's Galley, which is heroic ballad number two. See, he, he counted things a lot. He was kind of like Bruckner that way, too. Again, he was in exile in the penal colony of Bantakia, and he counted things when he wasn't looking at National Geographic and writing, you know, the complete o Omar Khayyam. You know, he, he, was, he was sort of all over the place, as you can tell. Disc number three. Ah, yes, the Cyprian goddess. This is his symphony number three. He called these things symphonies, but I mean, who are we kidding, right? I mean, they said if the, if the Hebridean symphony is anything to go by, symphonic was not necessarily his specialty, shall we say? And then we get the Helena Variations. That was named after the capital of Montana, quite clearly, Helena, Montana. And then Dante and Beatrice, his poem for orchestra. Now, Dante and Beatrice, oh, what a fun story that is, as you could well imagine. And it's full of lusciousness and sensuality. And that's the kind of thing that Bantock did really well. Then let's see, we get disc number four, Sappho, Prelude and Nine Fragments for Mezzo-Soprano and Orchestra. Quite lovely, extremely lovely, lovely and beautifully sung by Susan Bickley here. And then the Sapphic Poem for Cello and Orchestra. Now this is all the Royal Philharmonic uh, conducted by Vernon Handley. And Julian Lloyd Webber is the cellist here in the Sapphic Poem. And let's see here. Ah, this is this is too much fun. This we get on disc number five here, the prelude to the Song of Songs, which is of course as close as the Bible ever got to erotic poetry. And Bantock jumped on that one, as you can well imagine. He had run out of National Geographics by then. Uh, and the prelude to Omar Khayyam, which you can get the whole thing. And finally, oh, the Camel Caravan from Omar Khayyam. There's a camel caravan. Who knew? Let's see. And then there's this thing called the Hebridean Sea Poem number one. is called Caristiona. And you get the processional, which is orchestral scene number one. See all these. And then there's this kooky tone poem. Oh, this is a riot. It's called Thalaba, Thalaba, Thalaba. Yes. Thalaba the Destroyer. I mean, this is like Conan the Barbarian, right? There's, I mean, if Conan the Barbarian had been around when Bantock was around, he would have set it to music. He would have done a tone poem called Conan the Barbarian. Well, this is Thalaba the Destroyer. And the entire piece is a 
totally shameless ripoff of Tchaikovsky. As I said, this is one of those pieces that got Bantock in trouble for impersonating a composer, because boy, is he impersonating a composer. And the composer he's impersonating is Tchaikovsky. The whole piece sounds like sort of, you know, Francesco de Rimini in outer space, which is exactly what you would expect from something that comes from the moon Bantokia. I mean, it's, it's Francesco de Rimini in outer space. Uh, and finally, we get the overture to a Greek tragedy and the, the overture or tone poem thing, Piero of the Minute. And we get the wilderness and the solitary place, which is for soprano and orchestra. And finally, excerpts from the Song of Songs, excerpts from the second day, the third day, and the fifth day which only leads one to speculate about the first day and the fourth day, doesn't it? So, you know, these are all marvelously recorded and generally very good performances. Uh, you know, it's Vernon Handley. He's always reliable. Um, here it is in a box. Uh, you can maybe still get some of them separately if you're interested in Bantock. I do think that that, you know, he's not a composer to sample. You either go whole hog or don't waste your time because it's all going to sound pretty much like like it came from Bantokia. That's the whole idea, right? So, uh, you know, that's basically the story of dear old Granville Bantok, whose real name should have been Bartok, who wound up on Baxia and was exiled to Bantokia and who wrote tons and tons of orchestral music about exotic subjects of various degrees of of sensuality and color and occasionally mind-numbing repetition. That's the deal. So keep on listening, folks, and enjoy your band talk.